All right, well, y'all ready to jump in? Okay, well, I want to kind of show you something to get you started. This is going to sound, don't, don't confuse this with a business meeting. This is a real, a real thing. But I want to show you something about TLT's vision, right, and why it matters and why it even informs why we talk about some of the things that we'll talk about in this series, and that's this. The vision at the Lord's table this is to gather and mobilize believers to reach the lost by bringing hope, teaching truth, and showing them the way of life. Now, that's fine on a piece of paper, but some of these statements actually frame up and guide some of the things we talk about. And if you are going to listen to teaching, I hope you want people that are going to teach the truth. Scripture is often counterculture because it's an eternal truth, not a situational truth. And so some of the things we'll talk about in this series, we talk about these things because we've made a commitment to teach the truth, to bring hope in that, and show people the way of life. And you'll notice that's capitalized. That's Jesus's way of life, not just some way of life, not a church way of life, not even a TLT way of life, but the way of life. Amen. And so what I want to share with you today, I hope I hope almost touches on both of those. I hope you leave here hopeful. I hope you realize something that maybe you've not heard before. And as far as truth goes, and I hope that it helps inform you that if you are a person in this room and you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, then we have a certain way that we're supposed to live. Amen? And I hope to show you in the scripture today that some stuff that we deal with nowadays and some of the ways that the, that the current culture is telling you and I to live, that's a lie. It doesn't lead to the abundant life that Jesus wants for you and I. Amen? Boy, so you're thinking, what's he going to talk about? Well, before I talk about it, I want to give you one scripture It's out of Proverbs, you know, the book of wisdom here that says, if you become wise, you'll be the one to benefit. And if you scorn wisdom, you'll be the one to suffer. And so this applies to whenever God gives us the truth, we have two options. It's either to become wise, in other words, to adopt and align with God's word, or we can scoff at that and say, oh, that's old. Oh, that's outdated. That's not actually true. And what? You'll be the one to suffer. Now, someone far smarter than me said this, so you can't blame me. You can't get mad at me about it. I'm just saying that this is what Scripture tells us, that when we encounter God's Word, there are simply two choices. Amen? Would you agree? Well, you got to agree with that, I guess. I hope you do. All right? Well, let's pray. Father, thank you, God, that you give us the truth. Thank you that you teach us how to live. Thank you that in that there's hope. God, I just pray. That is, we spend time in your word today, that your Holy Spirit would be the loudest voice in the room. Speak to every person right where they are, God. Teach us, correct us, rebuke us, do all the things that you say that your word does. God, I just pray that you'll bless our time together, mostly that you'll be blessed, because we want to pursue you. We love you, and we want to serve you. We ask that you'll do it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so what we're going to talk about today, you'll notice a, a, a theme here is the relentless assault on personal responsibility. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a generational message, okay? Because if you're, if you're probably uh, my age, maybe just, I don't know, I'm pretty young, maybe the next generation up for me. So maybe if you're 60 and above, you really locked in on and were raised by a generation, particularly of Americans, that were all about personal responsibility, right? Uh, these, are, these are, you know, what they call, some, some of this, they called it the greatest generation. Everybody thinks of the greatest generation, but if you go back and study it, boy, oh boy, the life we live now and the life that was going on then are very, very, very different. Amen? As far as, like, how we viewed personal responsibility. So you might, if you're younger in this crowd, you might have never even heard what I'm about to teach you. But my point is, is that I want to bring that truth to you. I would be wrong if I didn't help you understand that in Scripture, there is an abundance, an abundance of instruction and teaching about how we are responsible for us. We can't keep playing a blame game that goes on in our current culture. Amen? So what does this lie sound like? Uh, how about this? Uh, if it wasn't for such and such, things would be better for me. How about that one? Uh, if they wouldn't have done that, then I wouldn't have had to done this. If he would treat me better, I would. You see how we're programmed to to do this situational interaction with people that it's all based about what they do. 
Now, this is good in theory, but you know how it shows up more actually is when someone mistreats you, what do you do? What about when someone curses you? I don't mean curses at you. Those are words. But I'm saying when, when, when they intend evil for you and they speak that towards you, what do you do? Is it eye for an eye? Is it evil for evil? And I don't mean what does the Bible say. I mean, what do you do? Because you're the only Bible some people are ever going to read. Amen? As a follower of Christ, you can't just say, yeah, I know, you know, bless those who curse you. I don't mean bless them like that, though. You know, it gets lost in the Southern translation, right? You can bless someone. It's not really blessing, is it? Right? So we got to know where we are. But it actually means bless those who curse you. Like, like, don't retaliate evil for evil. It doesn't work for us. And so for, for you and I, we, we, we need to know, what does Scripture tell me about my responsibility for me, for my actions, for my thoughts, for how I align with God's Word? Am I allowed to do like the culture and respond in kind to every little thing that happens? Am I allowed to follow along with the culture who says that the only reason I'm not where I want to be is because there's something against me? You see, the culture is telling you a lie that will rob you. Anybody want to be robbed today? You want something that's yours taken from you? No. But the truth of the matter is, is that this lie will rob you because if you don't take responsibility for your circumstance, then you have no ability to change your circumstance. If I'm a victim because so-and-so mistreats me, then I will always be a victim because they'll continue to mistreat me. You hear me? If you don't take responsibility for your circumstance, you can never elevate yourself out of your circumstance. That's not why Jesus died for you and I. He wants us to understand that, that, that there is promise in his word, there's instruction in his word, and he is there are a lot of things that I will admit in the Bible that you got to kind of work and you got to stretch to get. This one's easy. I'm going to read you a plethora, I had to fit that word in today, a plethora of scriptures that you, it is undeniable how God sees this particular topic and why if we will align with his word, then we'll benefit, as the scripture says. But if we scorn it, then we'll actually be the ones to suffer. We will actually, as Proverbs said, suffer under, our, under this relentless need for, for blaming others, for putting our, our actions on other people. You, are, you and I are meant to be influenced by the Holy Spirit, never controlled by another human. Amen? You and I were never meant to be driven by other people. You and I have always been designed to tune into his Holy Spirit and to serve one. Amen? Now, we serve other people, but not in, in a sense of control. Every time you see control mentioned in Scripture outside of God, it is, it's, it's equivalent to witchcraft. And it's not good. It's not what God wants for you and I. Amen? All right, you all ready for some Scriptures? I love Scriptures. Well, first of all, uh, it's like a teaser, right? So when the preacher says, I'm about to close, but he doesn't, uh, you're going to get to some scriptures here in a little bit. Uh, stewardship. First, you need to know this. This is a stewardship issue. If you don't know what stewardship is, super fast lesson. Number one, God owns everything. Absolutely everything. It's all his, and there's no debate about that. The thing, though, is, is that he invites us to take care of it. He invites us to live and to share in his goodness. He, he wants us to enjoy the things that he's created. Stewards don't have rights. Owners have rights. Stewards have responsibility. So if you live your life as though you have all these rights that everybody's violating, you're living like an owner, and that's not what you and I are. We're caretakers. We're, we're living a life that was given to us, that we were blessed with. We, it's not mine. You, you hear Paul say it all the time. It's, it, it, you know, for, for me to die is gain, you know, for me to live. is So you got to just sort of frame yourself in this mindset 
And this is where, uh, you know, stewardship a lot of times is talked about in a sense of giving, all right? So Christian uh, generosity, whether that's paying your tithes, offerings, this, that, and the other, it's always stewardship wrapped around that. But the point behind that is, is that when we are generous with what we have, it shows us that this is not mine anyway, that, that, that it reminds me that everything that I have, God has blessed me with. And so I'm going to do what he says with it because what? He's the owner. I'm the steward. I'm the caretaker. Our responsibility as stewards is, a, is literally a caretaker, an overseer, or a, uh, like in, in, I think it's Luke 16, it mentions uh, a wise manager of all the things God's given you. Amen? So number one, this idea of, of us taking personal responsibility, it's about stewardship. It's about taking care of what God has given us. I want to show you a quote by uh, Billy Graham. It says this, it says, the evangelistic harvest is always urgent. The destiny of men and nations is always being decided. Every generation is crucial. Every generation is strategic. But we cannot be held responsible for the past generation, and we cannot bear full responsibility for the next one. However, we do have our generation. God will hold us responsible at the judgment seat of Christ for how well we fulfilled our responsibilities and took advantage of our opportunities. What a great statement. You can look back and you can't, you're not responsible for that. You're, you're not fully responsible for what's ahead, partly because you should invest in that next generation. But at the same time, we live in a time where we are responsible to do uh, and manage what we have at our, at our hands. Amen? And so when we look at that, that's just a good, it's, it's a good quote because it puts it in kingdom perspective that when, even when it comes to evangelism, we have a responsibility we have a responsibility to be witnesses of what God has done, witnesses about who Jesus is, why he came, and why it's important that people know him. So that points to the evangelistic stuff, but it also shows up in our day-to-day, -day. all right? So I want to kind of make a very clear point with everybody because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying today. And, and, and I want to say this, that a lot of times we live our lives as though there's this separation or a veil between our everyday natural life and our spiritual life. I'm not sure exactly why we tend to do this, but when God saved you through Jesus, he saved the whole you. He didn't save Sunday you. He didn't save cleaned up you. He saved the whole you. He saved the you that you hope and pray no one ever knows about. He saved you in your biggest mess. He saved you at your most glorious moment. He saved you on, on uh, Monday or Wednesday or Friday. There's not a separation between that. So, so a lot of times we, we look at this as though we can live unsaved part of the time, but then whenever we feel spiritual, then all of a sudden we got to get right. You ever heard that saying? Get right. Don't get right. Stay right. Right? I mean, obviously, yeah, you're going to make mistakes, but just realize that God is with you through the whole thing. There's not a separation between these things. And if that's true, then this personal responsibility thing has to show up everywhere. Home, job, everything. You're responsible. I'll put it this way. You, this might be a shock to some people. You are solely and singularly responsible for your life. You don't get to blame other people. Now, obviously, is life hard? Absolutely. Do some people land in a better lot, so to speak? Sure. I get that. But wherever you are, wherever you are, I keep quoting my old pastor, bloom where you're planted, right? Wherever your seed falls in this life, be fruitful. Amen? whatever soil it is. James 2, verse 26 says this. It says, just as the body is dead without breath, also faith is dead without good works. A lot of times we get into this debate about works and faith, but the reality is, is, that, is that if we have faith, we will have good works. We will show a responsibility to influence the world around us for good, as Scripture defines it. And so when we, when we sit back and we say, oh, I'm a believer, but that's on Sunday, and then we don't do anything about that at our job, and we don't do anything about that in our friendships, and we're not doing anything about that in our marriages or in our, you know, anywhere we are, then you can't really say that you have faith because without 
the evidence of it showing up in the influence through your personal responsibility to do these things, it says it's dead. And so you can't live a detached kind of existence where you don't interact with the world. You just live in this world of faith. That's another lie. We, when, when God saved you, he ordained it and placed you in a place that he wants a representative, an ambassador, as the scripture calls it. You're an ambassador for Christ wherever you are. And when you represent him by speaking the truth, his word, bringing hope, and showing people a way of life, then you're representing him. Amen? What you and I do in the natural is born out of the spiritual. So I would say this. Some people will say, yeah, I get that, but it can't be completely true because I'm not always influenced by what I really believe. Paul talked about this, doing the things he shouldn't do not doing the things you should do. It is a struggle. So this isn't just like cut and dry. If you're, if, you're, if you're messing up, you're not, I'm not saying that. There's grace, there's mercy, there's forgiveness, there's all those things. But it can't be a, re- a reckless pattern of constantly messing up. Does that make sense? And there should be progress. There should be growth. We should be able to get past the things and develop the habits and, and, and begin to value God's word above. So here's my point. As a spiritual person, if I embrace fully the inerrant word of God and I believe that that's the truth and I live my life that way, then that will only reinforce itself. Does this make sense? Almost to the point that literally when I want to curse someone because they curse me, I, the Holy Spirit, will empower me through reminding me of the word that you're not supposed to curse them back. You're actually supposed to bless them, right? Boy, that stuff's harder than we talk about, isn't it? I'm up here acting like it's easy. It's not. It's not. I said it's not. It's not. should articulate myself better, shouldn't I? Okay, here we go. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. We'll each stand. So no one gets to stand with me, and I don't get to stand with anyone else. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20 says this, says the person who sins is the one who will die. The child will not be punished for the parent's sins, and the parent will not be punished for the child's sins. Righteous people will be rewarded for their own righteous behavior, and wicked people will be punished for their own wickedness. That's a good reminder. No piggybacking, all right? You're not guilty of something you didn't do, but you also don't get credit for anything you didn't do. You and I stand alone. Galatians Chapter 6, verse 4 says, pay careful attention to your own work, for then you'll get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't feel the need, or you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. And then follows up in Galatians 6, verse 5 with, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Think about this on your job. How many times are you watching what other people are doing more than you're watching what you're doing? Ah, that's a favorite pastime at work, right? Right? I did 10 and he did five. Did you do a good job? Worry about that. Because you know who sees it? The Lord sees it. If your boss don't see it, don't sweat it. God has a way of orchestrating amazing things for you. If you understand that he's seeing and he's keeping record and he's the one who rewards anyway, he's the one who gives you the the ability to get well. You don't need other people to see you. Amen? Amen. You're just going to make yourself miserable, and you're going to make yourself not work as hard. Do the best you can do. We're each responsible for our own conduct. Romans 14.2, I just threw this in there because I want to show you it's not just a one-off here. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. This is talking about, when he's talking about this, this is Paul writing, and he's talking about how we judge one another. In other words, how I will, I will look at someone and say, uh, hey, uh, boy, I see how, look, look, God, look how he's living. Look what he's doing. He ate pork. Get him, right? And Paul's saying, look, it's not about, the kingdom's not about eating and drinking. And you don't need to be, uh, you don't need to worry about them. Do you know God is capable of dealing with each and every person that you think is your job to deal with? 
What, what, if, what if we got to the point where if there was something and it wasn't big enough for us to actually be bold enough to go and have a conversation about, maybe you should just say, Lord, can you deal with them? My wife does this to me all the time. She knows I don't listen well. And so instead of talking to me, she'll start talking to the Lord and then tell him to come talk to me. And she's easier to ignore. Some of y'all are like, I'm doing that today. That's what I'm going to do, right? It's not a weapon. It's a tactic, strategy that she uses against me. No, not against me. For me, actually, because she's always for me. Amen? All right, here's another quote. This was back in the 80s. This was President Reagan. He said, we must reject the idea that every time a law is broken, society is guilty rather than the lawbreaker. It's time to restore the American precept that each individual is accountable for his actions. I would, that's good, yeah. You know, and, and, and it's fine, but I would maybe correct the former president and say, like, this isn't an American precept. It's a biblical precept. We're, we're, we are all accountable for our actions. Amen? I'll add to it also and say you're also accountable for your inaction. Sometimes doing nothing bears the same, bears, bears equal consequence. Amen? We have to be careful, guys. We, you, you've been given much. Think about your life. Think about everything that's in your life. God gave that to you to steward well. And just like in the Scripture where he basically the, the main passage where it talks about stewardship, he gives one ten talents, one five talents, and one one. And how they manage what they've been given is the determining factor about how the master feels about them in the end. And so you and I, most of us have been given much. So we have to steward that well, day in and day out. Amen? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 says, Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Oh, he said, that's right. Follows on with verse 11. It says, yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. Oh, watch your toes. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. Take note of those who refuse to obey what we say in this letter and stay away from them so they'll be ashamed. Don't think of them as enemies, but warn them as you would a brother or sister. Boy, this is serious stuff. Who knew this was in the Bible? Who knew that it talks so much about work and it talked so much about responsibility and it talks so much about how we interact with one another? And, and, and you know, when I read this scripture, I realize maybe, maybe God's, maybe Jesus isn't as nice as I thought he was, you know, because you think Jesus would say, never ignore anyone, you know, always be nice. But the reality is, is you and I need one another. There's a time when I need a kick in the behind. I need somebody, a trusted friend and a brother to come up to me and Gail and just be, hey man, you got to get with it. Snap out of it. Do what you got to do, right? And, and yet we live in such a kind culture that nobody actually confronts one another and nobody talks about accountability anymore. And nobody looks at one another in Christian love as a brother or sister and says, hey, you got to get this right. Why? Because I don't want you to suffer. Why would I, why in the world would I be on the phone with you knowing that you're trying to get to Maine, right? And you tell me, when I say, where are you at? You said, oh, I keep seeing a bunch of these signs for south of the border. <laughs> oh, yeah, south of the border is cool. I start thinking, wait a minute, that's South Carolina. What do you think I would do? Well, I'll see you. God bless, right? No, I would say, uh, what does a street sign say there? 95 South? You should turn around. And, and sometimes it's really that simple. We see one another headed in the wrong direction, and, and, and we're actually more inclined. I so how old I was. I clicked the phone down. Did you hear that? Actually, I hit the, hit the end button, right? I swipe, click. <laughs> Sorry. I said I was young earlier. It's not true. I remember these things, right? So you got, you know, what do you do? You just say, I don't say nothing. I don't say anything. I don't want to be upset with me. And you're going to let someone drive to Florida, drive off into the Gulf of Mexico because what? Because you just didn't care about them enough that they, you're suffering 
Every minute you drive down the road, that's a, another two you got to get back up this way to get where you're going. It's this simple, guys. We know where we're headed. We're all hopefully, as a brother and sister in Christ, I hope you know I want to live in line with this. And if you see me not, I hope you'll talk to me about it. I hope you'll take the responsibility, not just for you, but for me. That we're not so locked into this, this idea that we don't want to offend anybody, that, that, that we end up hurting one another just so that we don't offend anybody. Amen? Woo, this puts a lot of responsibility on us, doesn't it? Proverbs 6 says this, Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though you have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. But you, lazy bones, I don't know how they interpreted that one. I'm not sure of the translation. How long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. This is a book of wisdom telling us that, look, you have the ability to be a lazy bones, quote. You have the ability to sleep, and you have the ability to slumber, but it's also important that you hear somewhere from someone proclaiming the truth that that, that lifestyle will lead you into a place of poverty. That lifestyle uh, w- w- will lead to Poverty pouncing on you like a bandit and scarcity coming upon you like a robber. It'll happen. When we talk about personal responsibility, what are some real real things we're talking about? I learned this years, I mean eons ago from a pastor. And it was the mo- I'm gonna give I'm gonna teach it to you because it was the most annoying thing a pastor ever taught me. It may be the one thing that the Holy Spirit has used more than any lesson I've ever learned from a pastor. You ready for it? Plug your ears if you don't want to be tormented by the Holy Spirit for the rest of your existence. He said this. He said the most spiritual thing you can do sometimes is put the stuff back off the shelf that you're not going to buy when you go to the store. Push your buggy into the caddy. And I'm thinking... How's that spiritual? Because you know what? Every time I take a pack of hot dogs out of the freezer and I leave them by the toothbrushes, that means that somebody else has to go undo what I did. That means that I was too lazy to walk myself back to the meat section and put back what I wanted. Every time you decide, oh, it's too far to push the cart over there to the, to the cart rack, you're setting somebody up to hit their car and cause a bad day. And, and, you know, everybody gets quiet on this one because what? We all do it, right? So much easier to throw the hot dogs down in the, in the men's clothing section. I didn't want those anyway. I don't know why I picked them up, you know? And you think, like, this isn't spiritual, but it is the principle of spirit because you are who you are when no one's watching. You'll do the right thing when no one's looking, and you'll do the right thing when everybody's looking. And, it, and here's the other thing, is that if you can be faithful in even the most minor things, the Scripture says, that you, then you can be trusted with more. You want more? Be faithful with the little things. You want to grab onto this idea? Understand that both in a sense of everything spiritual, everything natural, how it all blends together, in all that, everything that the Scripture tells me is that I'm responsible for me. And that if I take responsibility for me, I'll end up, believe it or not, I am more inclined to do good things for me. I'm more inclined to not be robbed of the opportunity to affect my, li- my life, my circumstance, all that. If I believe that everything is someone else's fault, then it's someone else's deal to fix. And guess what? We usually don't like the way they fix it, if they fix it. So grab the responsibility for you and take responsibility for your life. Amen? Hmm. It got quiet. I'm not sure which part. Maybe it was a Walmart thing. (laughs) Say what you have to say and say what you mean. How about that? That's another one. Be responsible for your words. This is a peeve of mine, but I'm not using the Scripture to beat anybody up. Matthew 5, 36, 37 says, Don't even say, by my head, for you you can't turn one hair white or black. Just a simple yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. Now, back in the day when this was written, everybody would make vows about everything. They'd make these grandiose proclamations about stuff. What about just yes or no? 
What about if we move off of maybe? What if we move off of I intend to? See, the, here's the thing is, is nowadays it, it, commitment is a, uh, boy, no one wants to do that, do they? You know? It's really frustrating to people who are geared like me because I just want to know. Right? I want to, hey, let's get together and have lunch. Yeah, I'll try to make it. What does that mean? You know? No. We're going to sit in our normal booth at Highway 55 at 2 o'clock or 2.30. I was late the other day. I'm picking on a guy I had lunch with. Totally messed up. He had grace for me. But seriously, show up. Be there. Do, like, you, even be responsible for yourself in your words. Just say no if you can't do it. Just say yes if you can do it. Amen? This is a great way to live. Don't, 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 don't be foggy and don't be, just do it or don't do it. Because the more that you allow yourself to do this, then the less you'll even be, you'll even be a little sketchy in your commitment to God. Maybe I'll follow what you say. I'll try to follow what you say. I intend to follow what you say. No, I will follow what you say. No, I will believe your word over everything else I hear. No, I will commit myself to a, to a way of life that Jesus taught. No, I will. I will. I will. Right? So just follow through. Even in your words, it matters. I'm going to get us out of here with this verse. Revelation 22, 12 says this. Look, I'm coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. There is an end to this thing. So if you're, <laughs> if you're motivated by these type of things, it's always good to remember that there, at some point there's a period to all this. And that's when he comes back and he's promised that he will soon and he's going to repay everybody according to what they've done. Amen? So you and I have a, have a big responsibility now. If it was something that you already knew and you always lived this way, maybe it's a great refresher. If this is something new and you've lived a life where you constantly blame other people and you constantly blame circumstances that are beyond your control and you're somebody who doesn't realize that God has this continuous message in his word that you are responsible for you, then I encourage you to just chew on this this week. This is a big message if you've never heard it before. It, it's, it's revelation type stuff that makes you realize that the way God sees me is he does see me in, in my relationship with the body of Christ, but yet there's also a singularity about it that I'm responsible for. I'm responsible to love him, to follow him, to believe him, to serve you, to do good deeds everywhere I am, to be a good ambassador for the one who saved me wherever I'm planted, right? To be faithful in the little things. Whether he gives me big things or not, I'm called to be faithful in every little thing, to be true with my words. Amen? Would you stand with me? Hey, all right. Makes me feel like you're not mad at me. Listen, guys, we've been given much. One of the greatest things we've been given is the offer of salvation through Jesus Christ. The offer to not just eternal life, but forgiveness. To be cleansed and set free. To be made new. You get to wipe the slate clean, start all over. And you get to live for the one who lived and died for you. If you're here and you've never made Jesus your Lord and Savior, then I want to invite you to join us in the back corners. If you guys there that are willing to answer any of your questions, to pray with you, help you understand these things. It's not something that we take lightly, so we want to spend time and talk to you about it. But if you have been saved, then let's make a commitment. Uh, let's make a commitment to live the way of life that Jesus taught. It's a better way. I don't want any of you to be robbed. I don't want any of you to waste any time going the wrong way. I pray that the message helps. Pray that you receive it the way that God wants you to receive it, that the Holy Spirit speaks to you throughout the week about these things. Amen. And that he continues to speak to me about. It. Father, I pray that you bless your people. God, be with them in their coming and going. God, I pray that their, the blessing that you have upon them overflows into the lives of every person they encounter. God, that when people leave their presence, they'll know that there was something different about that guy, that lady. 
that they were just with. Lord, watch over them, bless them, and give them all the opportunity to share the love of Christ wherever they go. I pray that you'll help them and that you'll do that for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon.